and I'll discuss the climate system as a heat engine briefly. And then we'll get to the small scale to my recent work with my colleagues discussing the deep convective contribution and specifically the deep mid-latitude contribution under very specific synoptic setup, specifically the upper level winds. And it turns out you can get an internal hydraulic jump um, at the tropopause just because a storm is in the way, like a rocket in the river, which is kind of cool. So let's begin with the large scale. The climate can be the climate system or the Earth system can be conceptualized as a heat engine. And this idea has been around for a long time, maybe maybe a hundred years. Definitely, Ed Lorenz was thinking um, in these ways. And you can conceptualize the hot reservoir as our surface, where we get primarily heated by shortwave, and a cold reservoir aloft near the tropopause. Uh, however, it's not nearly as simple as a Carnot engine or a, an engineering um, heat engine because we're also an energy balance. And so unlike a, an engine that can export work to do something useful external to the system, being an energy balance means that all of the work is done on the system itself. So Q in here equals Q out. We get work from this transiently that work eventually is dissipated by friction. A lot of work isn't produced because of the enormous irreversibility of so many things in the earth system, primarily um, including um, our subsaturated atmosphere with respect to water vapor and the three phases of water. And so instead you can define a mechanical efficiency for the climate system that compares Q in, which remember equals Q out, uh, to some uh, rate of working, if each of these were rates, this would be some rate of kinetic energy uh, production. And so here we see this heat engine working to bring primarily convectively uh, warm air aloft, and then there's you know slower, larger regions of subsidence. And so this is the climate system heat engine. And it's a function of these two temperatures. However, these temperatures are weighted over all of the different mass in the system that is losing or gaining energy radiatively. Or however you choose to define your system, you can draw the boundary in a number of places. Um, Marty Singh at Monash in Australia and I have just finished a review for Reviews of Modern Physics and that we don't know when that'll come out. It's just been accepted, but we review all of the different ways to, to uh, imagine the climate system as a heat engine. And so T in and T out are weighted by, you know, things like uh, where the clouds are and what level they are to determine what short wave where gets absorbed at what temperature. It's a very, very um, uh, complicated system because these are not externally imposed is what I want to say. The climate manifests in some way, and these are functions of the system itself. These are not external temperatures. Um, so this heat engine is interesting in its own right, but it's also changing, and that makes it uh, an interesting thing to study as well. CO2 loading is cooling the stratosphere and warming the troposphere. Uh, Manabe of Nobel Prize in physics fame. Um, it turns out, and this was just observationally found this year, that we knew for a while that the troposphere has been expanding, but it turns out that the stratosphere predictably is contracting as well. We are, we are expanding the warm part, and that makes sense in an ideal gas, and we're contracting the cold part aloft. And this is just due to CO2 loading. There's no role for water here. But what I'm going to talk about is the additional role of water and its potential to serve as either a forcing or a feedback on the climate system, and then where that water, water might come from and whether we're quantifying it correctly uh, even now. Stratospheric water vapor has a number of really important roles in the climate. Um, uh, work in PNAS in 2013 suggested that there could be a positive feedback loop uh, via deep convection. That's something I'm really interested in. And we're going to talk about deep convection. And a number of papers have looked at 
how effectively deep convection can inject water vapor into the lower stratosphere, whether that's, uh, I believe these papers are in the tropics or at mid-latitudes. Uh, stratospheric water vapor promotes ozone destruction. So it's my understanding that with higher relative humidity, ozone is uh, more rapidly destroyed under complicated chemical um, uh, reactions that I am not capable of getting into. And additionally, it's possible that more stratospheric water vapor induces more surface warming. Although a couple papers that came out last year um, kind of uh, suggest that the radiator forcing itself is quite small and it's the other uh, reactions in the atmosphere that can make that surface warming significant. So that is uh, an ongoing area of research. The tropopause is a strong barrier to water vapor reaching the stratosphere. So here is a nice plot from a paper a decade ago um, that shows the cold point tropopause here, and then a climatology of cloud top height. And you can see how cloud tops are really bounded by the tropopause. And that makes sense because the stratosphere above it is very stratified, hence the name. And so there's a lot of thermodynamic uh, or yeah, inhibition uh, from allowing convection to get any higher than the tropopause. You can see that this is not very continuous. In fact, um, air can flow along these isentropes between this relatively low tropopause we have in our mid and high latitudes and this very high region here. There's a lot of wave breaking in the subtropics. And so you can get isentropic exchange between the um, between the tropics and the mid latitudes. And I want to, with the next slide, um, introduce two different regions of the stratosphere that play different roles and have different time scales. And so I have uh, abusively drawn over this uh, nice plot. And I want to indicate to you the stratospheric middle world, which is the stratosphere bounded above by the 380 Kelvin potential temperature surface. So what's special about this particular surface? Why does it, why does it get a name above and below? We can see that this surface roughly coincides with the top of the tropopause in the tropics, but is well above the tropopause at more polar latitudes. And so this stratospheric middle world and the stratospheric middle world is able to communicate uh, more easily with the tropical tropopause or the, uh, sorry, tropical tropopause layer. And we have the stratospheric overworld aloft and it's just harder to reach. And these are both dominated in circulation by the Brewer-Dobson circulation. So the cold point tropopause, this region in the upper troposphere in the tropics is the coldest place in the whole atmosphere under 50 kilometers altitude. So anywhere relevant to us, uh, turns out that the tropics are the coldest place right here near the tropopause. There's also an exception for the polar stratosphere in, in the winter, but this on average is by far the coldest point. And it also serves as the entry point or the pump for the Brewer-Dobson circulation, which is this large wave-driven overturning circulation that takes place in the stratosphere. And it moves the very, very little water vapor it gets around over long time scales. And so we have upwelling largely due to subtropical wave breaking, um, forcing large scale slow ascent in the tropical tropopause layer. And we also have just direct deep convection uh, which is injecting water vapor and ice, which can sublimate because the conditions are often subsaturated. And so we have two different sources for water vapor here. But the reason I'm stressing that this is the cold point is because the temperature is so low that this region serves as a cold trap, people commonly call it. It's so cold that very little water vapor can get past it because of the clausius clapeyron relation. The saturation vapor pressure here is extraordinarily low. And so this serves as a 
very strong control on limiting the amount of water vapor that can make it into the Brewer Dobson circulation. And it's for this reason that the stratosphere is very dry. Um, yes, and there are two sources here, as I suggested. Um, storms in the mid latitudes are, you know, they are also bounded by the tropopause in general, and so they tend to be much shorter. But there's actually a very substantial exception. The deepest storms in the mid latitudes can actually directly inject water vapor and ice into the stratospheric overworld. So if we go back, remember that this is the overworld. This is the region of the stratosphere that uh, coincides with the top of the tropopause, uh, but is well into the stratosphere at mid, at mid latitudes. So if we go forward again, we can see that there is a certain class of storms, very deep, intense, strong thunderstorms or storms associated with the uh, Asian and North American monsoon anticyclones. And these storms can actually be so intense that they can dump water vapor directly into the overworld, but also into the middle world. And actually the radiative impact of water vapor in the middle world is a lot stronger than the smaller amount of water vapor in the, old, in the overworld. And so this particular source is the least quantified and understood, I would say, of all the different ways that you can get water vapor in the upper atmosphere. We also have um, CH4 oxidation, which provides a, a direct in situ source of water vapor up there. But it's this, it's this very transient, small scale, um, noisy signal that I'm most interested in. Um, not least because it makes really gorgeous storms that are pretty to look at. One of the reasons that it's important to consider the water vapor that gets into the Brewer Dobson circulation this way is it's very easy for water to enter the Brewer Dobson circulation and be advected back toward the tropics at upper levels and back up into the circulation because this water never goes through the cold trap. And so this previous kind of choke point for maintaining a very dry stratosphere uh, is completely bypassed if we can pump water into the lower stratosphere without cooling it this much. And so this is kind of like a, like a workaround to get water vapor up there at higher amounts. And so it's, it's common to find actually in the downwind in space and time of deep convective storms, very, very high amounts of stratospheric water vapor at mid-latitudes. So keep in mind, this is the 380 Kelvin surface. This is the surface that bounds the lower stratospheric middle world from the upper overworld. And let's look at some data. So this is a paper discussing case studies of in situ observed water vapor concentrations from a series of flights, uh, including this dedicated campaign looking specifically for um, you know, storm injected mid latitude water vapor. This, I believe these, this campaign uh, was out of Houston in 2013. These other campaigns, I don't remember where they took off. Uh, but you can see these different events indicating really, really substantial water vapor injection to very high levels. So see here, we have this 380 Kelvin potential temperature surface indicated here. In fact, our altitude is where we're using a potential temperature um, axis on the left. And we have our water vapor mixing, mi mixing ratio on the, on the bottom. So a mixing ratio of five is the typical lower stratospheric mixing ratio once you get above the cloud level and you get above the tropopause. So, so this here, this, this region here of five ppmv, or parts per million by volume, is typical. And anything above that is showing this really remarkable mid-latitude hydration uh, that can be associated with, in particular for this seekers campaign that was looking downstream of very substantial deep convection. Um, these storms have, you know, 
clearly uh, injected an enormous amount of water vapor. And so this has been this has been observed by planes. And I think there's there's certainly lots of visual evidence that that's happening right right above the anvils, uh, which I'm going to show you soon. And that's the feature that I'm interested in. We can also see that this is. Oh, excuse me, Morgan. Oh, can you explain better what the, the, this plot is? I mean, what is the point on this plot? Is it one observation with at one location so, somewhere in the, in the uh, atmosphere? That's a great question. So, so these are so these are not balloon soundings. Um, these measurements were taken from planes flying towards targets. And so they took place over a range of locations, I think all or almost all over the continental US. And at least for the Seekers campaign in 2013, um, it was intentional to fly downstream of, of deep convection. And a similar campaign is going on actually this summer and next summer. So the point here is to show you that even though we would expect if, if water were really only coming out of the deep tropics upward, um, from deep tropical convection and, and slow upwelling, we would expect just five ppmv uh, concentration in the mid-latitude stratosphere. But we see um, locally, transiently, much, much higher values because there is a local source in space and time. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So if we look if we now look at a map of, I believe this came from satellite observations, um, of again, the 380 Kelvin surface, this boundary uh, of between the middle world and the overworld of the stratosphere, which as you recall in the, in the mid-latitudes is, is well into the stratosphere, it's, it's well above the tropopause. We can see that there are two substantial hotspots. And so it turns out that sampling over the, North American continent is a, a unique place in the Northern Hemisphere, along with uh, this hot spot over the Asian continent. And this is particularly so in summer, and that turns out to be our, our storm season. We have deep, well-organized uh, supercell thunderstorms um, in the spring and summer. That's when the season peaks. And so the sampling has taken place then to find these really strong invective, uh, convective sources. So in particular, a primary suspect for injecting this really substantial anomalous water vapor is something called the AACP or the above anvil cirrus plume. So this is a very deep thunderstorm. Uh, I don't remember where this is. This might be over Oklahoma. Um, but anyways, you can see this really deep bubbling supercell thunderstorm in mid latitudes. Here's the overshooting top like popcorn, it's trying to um, you know, punch through the troposphere. It's mostly failing, but you can see this kind of like milky sheet behind it that is narrower and it has a slightly different texture than, than the broad anvil that wraps around. Can you kind of see this different textural region? This is, this is an extra uh, region of cirrus of cirrus uh, of ice particles and water vapor, although we can't see it in this image, certainly, um, that is being additionally injected above the large anvil itself. You can think of this very large, growing, spreading anvil as being capably capped by the tropopause and not really dumping water vapor in any meaningful way into the tropopause. But right in the lee of this deep convection, it seems like there's an additional source aloft of water vapor. And you might think that this particular loop is very unconvincing. There's lots of very convincing evidence and people have written papers on populations of these features and I'll cite them later. Uh, but there's another reason and, and you know, it's not, not the purpose of this seminar, but another reason that this feature, this plume kind of ship's wake feature, some have called it this kind of downstream uh, AACP is important. And that's because it has really substantial forecasting potential. We can't see tornadoes from space. We can't see a deadly hailstorm from space, but we can see these. And it turns out, um, and this was found in really nice work by Chris Bedka and colleagues in weather forecasting, that this feature 
um, statistically significantly precedes the worst, most deadly storms. In fact, preceding by them by enough time uh, to rival that provided by a forecaster who might be looking at instead maybe climate models or radar. So you can do this without radar, which is really powerful. Some regions don't have radar. Sometimes radar is taken out by a tornado. So this is just an additional motivation to study this really fascinating feature. And I find it particularly exciting to study because it has both this like kind of urgent, you know, save lives now uh, potential, as well as this also substantial potential for moistening the global stratosphere, uh, all in one. So let's study it. Typical. What is study, the scale sorry? of this image, uh, Morgan? Ah, that's a great question. This is probably several Midwestern states. I would say that each of these is maybe uh, maybe 70 kilometers across, perhaps. So this is a very, very large region. These are each, you know, monster dangerous thunderstorms, some of which are producing tornadoes, probably when this satellite image was taken. Um, great. OK. So with my colleagues, um, Lee Orff, Jerry Hemsfield, and Kelton Halbert, we studied these. And this is work that recently came out actually just a month ago in science. <clears throat> and we ran a couple simulations modified from a previous paper's work showing that the reason you do or don't get an AC AACP is due to the upper level winds. And that's actually really encouraging because we can measure upper level winds uh, with a number of ways. We can also resolve upper level wind shear and wind magnitude pretty well with climate models. And so right off the bat, I just want to point out that, you know, to have uh, a wind, an environmental wind profile be the control over something that then maybe downstream has these enormous impacts on both climate and the potential for hail and tornadoes is uh, a very exciting thing to study. And so we ran two simulations. They kind of look like this, except this is this is an older rendering. We haven't done this for our storms. See this little tornado here? Our simulations don't get tornadoes. We're running um, too fast and too short and too idealized. So we don't we don't have one of these, but otherwise it looks very similar. And so we run one with very strong upper level winds, very fast winds, and one with very slow winds aloft, expecting that we'll get an AACP here and that we won't get one here. The difference though, between our study and previous studies is that we ran at much higher resolution than had ever been used before to study this feature. And we believe we came up with the right conceptual model to understand it, which should allow us to ultimately predict when it can occur and why. Uh, and so here immediately are the results from the two different simulations. So here on the left, we have a small time series of snapshots from the storm that we believe will produce an AACP. And here we have the slow case. And I'll just explain these contours really quickly. Above the 360 Kelvin potential surface, we have potential temperature surfaces um, indicated with these magenta lines. You can see this developing standing gravity wave here in the lee of the storm. Oncoming wind, oncoming environmental wind is coming from the left. In all cases, we have this storm developing uh, downstream of this, this either strong or weak stratospheric wind. Here in the blue, we have in the troposphere uh, streamlines, instantaneous streamlines for the flow. We color the field by the water vapor mixing ratio. You can see the values here on the right. And then finally, ah, and then we, we contour what is likely the cloud, the visible cloud boundary by this black line. So that boundary is probably what you'd see. And finally, this red contour indicates uh, the region of total wind speeds exceeding 75 meters per second. So really, really, really fast wind speeds right here at the tropopause. And this is what is going to develop into a jump here. So at 40 minutes, we can see this standing gravity wave in the lee 
of this overshooting top, this overshooting deep convection. This overshooting deep convection is serving as an obstacle in the way of this oncoming stratospheric flow. And some of that flow has to go up a bit and over the overshooting top and actually uh, goes under hydraulic control and erupts into a hydraulic jump. But the first thing I wanna show you because this will come up soon is this small region of uh, turbulence aloft in what otherwise is mostly dry air, but you can see, I don't know if you can see that tiny patch of light blue there. There's a little bit of water vapor up there. Um, uh, and this is a strong region, of, a small region of breaking gravity waves before the jump gets underway. And I'll show you a movie so I can convince you that the jump hasn't started yet. Five minutes later, um, which is such a short time scale in terms of uh, climate questions. And so this is where I'm really, um, giving you whiplash and asking you to think about short and fast and small things. Just five minutes later, we have this enormous gravity wave breaking. Um, and what's happening is the wave, the wave being developed by this uh, gravity wave in the lee of the storm is breaking onto itself. And this becomes the AACP. Right here, you can see this turbulent region, this breaking wave region with small patches of blue here, but after a while it becomes very, very visible. Here we're coloring water vapor mixing ratio, but this is also a region of high ice content as well, and that's something you'd be able to see. And so you can see this prong of uh, visible in the, in the ice field um, cloud that is aloft of the overshooting top and stretching out ahead of it a little bit and also pouring downwind. And now all of a sudden we have enormous amounts of water vapor above the anvil, but also including above this 380 Kelvin surface. This is the surface we've looked at. This is the surface that we're interested in seeing whether we can get water vapor above it due to deep convection. And so you can see here, you know, I showed you before that the background value is five, uh, uh, parts per million uh, by volume or, or eight in these models if they've been prehydrated by upstream deep convection. So anywhere you see color here, anywhere there's color at all, means there's much, much, much more water vapor than the background amount. And so you can see this is significantly hydrated well above the 380 Kelvin potential temperature surface. In contrast, if the winds are slower, very different dynamics happen. There's something that happens in the lee of this overshooting top that's called flow separation instead. And you can see that a gravity wave kind of sort of starts to develop in the lee, but actually that just separates and maintains a relatively laminar flow over the storm um, aloft of a, a turbulent layer that is not well organized. And so you never see, if we go back to panel C, you never see this huge ramp down and the speed up of a mix of stratospheric and tropospheric air. There's a separation here and that wave never develops. And so you still get some water vapor injection, especially into the middle world, you actually get even more. I'll show that time series soon, um, but you, you never get close to the rate of injection into the overworld. So it's this special feature, it's this jump that happens within a matter of minutes due to a small amount of turbulent al turbulence aloft that all of a sudden makes the storm a qualitatively different hydrator <clears throat> of the stratospheric overworld. So I'm gonna show a video so that you can see this. Um, this first part of the video, actually, this I, I'm not able to change this. It's, it's, in the, it's in the movie already, but this is shaded by horizontal wind speed, just to be clear, not, not vertical wind speed. So you're going to see wind speeds that um, meet and exceed 90 meters per second. And the surface that we're looking at is a cloud ice surface. So this is something that you could, you could see with your eyes. This is not water vapor. You can see a number down here um, in seconds. And this number, uh, when it gets to around 2,700, that's when the jump starts. So I want you to, you, you'll notice that the behavior changes a lot around 2,700. So I'll play. Remember the color indicates the speed. So we can see where it's very fast colored by the yellow. 
and we're just about to see the jump now. And now we can see that breaking gravity wave that is now dumping ice and water vapor deep into the stratosphere. Of course, you can't see the water vapor here. You can't see um, the ice under the threshold chosen here. But this looks like a, like a crashing ocean wave, doesn't it? This is something I think I'll show this feature when we get to it after a few more slides. This is the, this is the turbulent region aloft before the jump starts. Uh, maybe I'll show it now. And you can watch that time step in the lower left again. You're going to see that there is qualitatively different behavior about now. And yep, now you see this massive crashing or this hydraulic jump um, that is arresting this very rapid flow. You can see that we're going from total speeds of over 90 meters per second to, you know, six meters per second or less, you know, basically like a complete stop. Um, these I don't want to show yet. So let's go to the next thing. Nope, I don't want that. Okay, so what we were able to do uh, in this high resolution model is release tens of thousands of parcels into the flow and run them upstream and downstream. And so we released two different populations to make this particular plot. One population was released right in the jump. And here in this plot for these jumping parcels, we'll call them, I'm only plotting the parcels that exceed a speed of 110 meters per second. Um, this model that we're running, this numerical model is extremely well validated. Hundreds of papers by other people have been written using it. And this is not the highest resolution it's been run at. And we actually compared our simulations with observations to, to verify their realism uh, where we could. So this is not, this might be real. I don't know. We need to borrow a NASA research plane. But anyways, here are the parcels that exceed 110 meters per second. This is them going through the jump. Here they are super critical. Here we see that gravity wave breaking. And here we see the cap or the lid above this jump. And I'm going to motivate that soon. We're going to look at examples of more simple jumps. Um, and actually quite quickly, I better move. Um, we can see these parcels, not just in wind speed, which is the color here, but also in potential temperature where we can see very, very warm stratospheric parcels pour over the storm. Uh, we can see the upper troposphere and lower stratospheric parcels also well um, uh, stratified by temperature. And then if I allow the integration to go a little bit further, you can see there's substantial mixing downstream. This is the hydration of the stratosphere because cold in potential temperature, but very moist air is pouring up in the core of the storm. Meanwhile, warm, dry air is pouring down over the overshooting top, speeding up to remarkable, insane speeds, and then exploding in this mixing turbulence that substantially hydrates warm air. And this is irreversible. This water is not coming out uh, rapidly. This water vapor is not coming out rapidly of the lower stratosphere. So I've talked a bit about hydraulic jumps. They are really well known in many engineering contexts. For example, this is uh, maybe the, the sluice gate of a dam or something where someone can get caught. But the basic idea is um, if you have a supercritical flow, which just means that the, the, the flow speed is faster than the gravity wave speed, then if you go, if you encounter a topographic obstacle, then you trade some kinetic energy for potential energy. You see the layers thicken somewhat, and then you trade it back and the flow speeds back up again. And it's super critical the whole time. If the flow is slow, if we have a fruit number uh, less than one where the flow allows gravity waves to propagate upstream, then you could have a subcritical flow that speeds up a little bit going over an obstacle, trading some of that PE for KE kinetic energy, and then trading it back, thickening and slowing again. A hydraulic jump is a case where you have a subcritical flow, but its fruit number is pretty high, such that when it speeds up, that would be this case here, we're trading some PE for some KE. When it speeds up, it reaches the point of F equals one. It becomes critical. 
And now instead of trading that KE back for PE, now that it's become critical, it's going to continue to speed up and, trans and convert even more potential energy to kinetic energy. And so you get supercritical flow in the Lee of a topographic obstacle, but that becomes unstable because of the shear profile. And so you get a jump, which is simply a turbulent, violent transition to a subcritical slow flow again. And so this is what's happening, except this is happening above a thunderstorm. And our topographic obstacle is not even solid. It's, it's air as well. So internal hydraulic jumps have been known about in atmospheric science for a while, even though the atmospheric problem is so difficult because there's no lid, there's no, you know, there's no water surface. Uh, but you can still get them in the atmosphere. And here's a very famous photo of one. We have mean wind flowing from the right, um, pouring down the mountain, warming, compressing. And so all the water vapor that is in this, uh, this flow that you can't see um, only becomes condensed and visible when the hydraulic jump happens and all of this air is uh, lofted rapidly and turbulently and it condenses again. So you can see this really beautiful towering wall of clouds here in the Lee, because this is the hydraulic jump. And this was the region of supercritical, very thin, very warm flow. It's a lot harder in a continuously stratified atmosphere without an obvious lid to define a fruit number, but it's been done for this topographic case where this H here, this topography is, is solid and not a function of time. Um, and this is done by some authors in the 80s. And they found that when you don't have a lid that is simple, like you would for a, a boundary between water and air, when you're in a uh, continuously stratified flow, there are three different ways that you can still get a jump. And all of them involve some finding some vertical length scale that acts like a cap. And so one way, if you have constant U and M, that's a constant oncoming wind speed from your environment and a constant stratification is you can get, you know, you can just start with breaking gravity waves aloft that serve as a lid because they prevent vertical gravity wave propagation. So that's one way. The other way is to have a variable stratification that'll trap waves as well, or a variable wind. But in our simulations, we have a constant U and a constant N. And that's just because we got um, those soundings from a previous paper. We didn't anticipate running this particular experiment. That's what we did. And we got a hydraulic jump. The problem is, unlike the many idealized papers that impose a topography to induce gravity wave breaking and to evaluate the Froude numbers that come out of that flow, our mountain, our topography is a storm. And that storm is a function of time and it's also a function of the oncoming wind. These storms are not identical under these two different wind strengths. They, they have different shapes. So this is something that we have a lot of work to do on. Um, and I wanted to motivate that, sorry. I wanted to motivate the need for wave breaking aloft to induce a crit critical layer before the jump occurs because that's exactly what we see in this model. So you can see there's wave breaking aloft and that's sufficient in an environment of constant oncoming wind and constant stratification. So if we go back to our movie and we go maybe um, here, no, maybe, yeah, great. Uh, okay, so here, this right here is the breaking gravity wave aloft before the jump has happened. This is our cap. This defines the distance or the, the vertical height or scale um, that traps the gravity waves and then induces a hydraulic jump. So if you watch this, look for that timestamp again in the lower left. We're looking at 2700. That's when a jump, yep, and right on time. Now we have this massive jump that uh, was possible because there was a critical layer aloft preventing gravity wave uh, vertical propagation. Okay, so lastly, I'm just gonna take another two or three minutes and then I'll leave time for questions. 
Um, we also looked at the water vapor injection of this feature and we compared the two storms. Um, we obviously expect the hydraulic jump to be a more effective hydrator of the overworld. And so if we look at the time series of the overworld, where we have marked this jump onset, which we've now seen in movies, we've marked it at minute 45, that's when it occurs. Um, we can see that once the jump starts, the AACP producing storm all of a sudden leaps to a, an injection rate of seven tons per second of water vapor, not just into the stratosphere, but into the overworld where it might be there for a long time. The story about the middle world is different. We actually see that it's our weaker wind storm with the dashed line that is a better hydrator of the middle world. And so certainly both of these storms have really significant bearing on the radiative balance of the lower stratosphere because radiatively lower water vapor, uh, which is much more abundant, is um, acting as a stronger greenhouse gas. And so we can see that the storm that doesn't produce a jump is actually a little bit more effective. But in the overworld, the story is really that in terms of both ice, frozen, frozen water and water vapor, we can see this really substantial injection. And it all starts right at the jump onset. And so I think the obvious question is this, what are our climate models missing? They are definitely not resolving features like this. I, I believe that this can be marginally resolved at a grid spacing of one kilometer. There's evidence in papers that gets close, although the injection rate is not, not as high, not by at least a factor of two. But as soon as you're talking about a climate model grid spacing of you know, 10 to 20 kilometers, forget it. This source is completely invisible to climate models. And so this massive deep convective um, hydration has to be entirely parameterized but if we didn't know it was this high before, then our parameters, our parameterizations have to be wrong. And so this is something that I'm really interested in. Um, I just have this final plot here of um, the peak domain winds near the tropopause. You can see, you can see peak domain winds jump in the AACP producing storm right at the onset of the jump. And we have some strong but not amazing surface winds. So finally, uh, to kind of wrap things up, I want to go back, I want to zoom out and go back to the big picture of stratospheric water vapor and its potential to be a positive feedback. Um, whether it is a purely radiative feedback is recently disputed, but there's a lot of evidence uh, across a lot of models that suggests in these fully coupled models, it could have a substantial impact. And that cycle looks like this. And I'm going to inject my, my role in it, which is this deep, uh, supercell thunderstorm with this little AACP streaming out the top. And so we can imagine that deep convection hydrates the stratosphere. And every time we look, there's more evidence. I mean, I haven't seen, I, I'm not sure I've seen any literature that, that goes backwards in terms of uh, estimates or rates or amounts. Um, we just keep underestimating it. So that will probably continue. The lower stratosphere cools directly and be indirectly because of ozone destruction. The lower troposphere and surface warm to some extent, this part is a little bit less clear, but to the extent that the entire troposphere warms, we expect specific humidity to increase via Clausius clapeyron And that has led to, it's been shown in research using um, a suite of uh, climate change simulations, the ingredients for energetic storms increase. So the only missing link for this new hydraulic jump mechanism we've found is how do the winds change? Because it turns out that for the overworld at least, it's a very strong function of whether your oncoming winds are high or low. And that's just so, that's potentially so transient and small scale. And so I think that, you know, we just, we need better models and more computers to hack away at that problem. So finally, um, Maybe I won't go through these numbers. This is maybe just some validation of our, our simulation, which uh, if you consider the typical AACP lifetime observed from satellite, then our storm, if that was a realistic simulation of one, would have injected 13.7 kilotons of water into the overworld. And that was an estimate observationally, right? It's close to an estimate observationally 
of the amount of water vapor injected uh, by, by uh, plane observations. So this could be a really substantial source. It probably is. We just have very sparse observations and very coarse climate models. And so fortunately, there's another field campaign sampling out of Kansas again this summer and next. And finally, these are questions that I'm interested in and that we're going to uh, keep working on. So thank you very much for your time. My email is below. I would love feedback or ideas or analytical solutions to a internal hydraulic jump that has a movable, permeable, moist bottom boundary. Um, so I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this very nice talk. So we, we, have, we have plenty of time for, for questions. So I think you can directly uh, speak. Uh, I have okay. a oh. go, You go, Lisa. Lisa. Oh, okay. So uh, I want to just give a very simple question about the background wind. I mean, depending on the wind speed, uh, this situation seems to be quite different. So that is a kind of a control parameter representing somehow scale interaction between this convection and some large scale. I mean, still, uh, I'm wondering. What is this uh, background wind? It is uh, from synoptic scale motion or it is generated by the characteristic of the thunderstorms? I mean, oh, that's a wonderful think... question. Yeah, the answer is that this is an environmental upstream wind that has not been modified by the by the storm. So this is this is the oncoming wind. And and these profiles were actually they're they're idealizations, but their magnitudes were, were informed and inspired uh, by Homeyer et al. Uh, using reanalysis data upwind of very large storm systems. So you think it is a quite independent choice? I mean, you could be anything, and then you know this structure could be embedded in somehow, or there is a correlation and to determine this structure between background and this. Yeah, I like that question a lot. Mm -hmm. I believe that's a storm shape. Um, it's morphology and behavior is definitely a function of you. Mm -hmm. And I think and hope that you is an independent parameter. Okay, I see. Yeah. Although I showed another figure and, you know, you might say, I guess if, I guess if you, the environmental winds are coming here from the, from the left uh, west boundary. Yeah, that looks pretty undisturbed. It, yeah. Might be a little bit dependent, but hopefully mostly independent. I mean, I just wonder where is the jet located for this kind of a structure, and because of that, I ask this question. Yeah, yeah, I I don't remember where the jet tends to sit during these storms if it's right on top of them, mm -hmm. or if it's a little bit to the north. That's a good question. I should know that. So on the on this picture, uh, where is the hydraulic jump? Do do we see them? Uh, are there this uh, feature we probably, in the middle of? Uh... We probably can't. So, for example, it would be here in the shadow. Um, this looks like it's maybe not producing anymore. It would have been. It would just generally be in the lee of the overshooting top. So you can find the overshooting top here near sunset. You can see that they have these nice shadows, uh, and then they tend to produce, if they do produce an AACP, it's just generally downwind of the mean flow. So we can actually tell where the mean flow is coming from, it must be coming from here. Um, and so no, we can't, we can't distinguish this by eye yet from satellite. I'd really like to get a field campaign to do this up close. So at, uh, in your last slides or the you, you, you gave some numbers about the injection rate of water vapor. So, so, you, so is, uh, I mean, to, to what can I, can we compare these uh, numbers? For instance, here you, you have uh, tens of kilotons. I mean, what? Um... Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm not yet well enough familiar with, um, points of comparison for these numbers. So part of the problem is um, different studies haven't always uh, identified like locally 
um, what the potential temperature of their, their measurements is. What I'm trying to say is we need to differentiate water vapor between the middle world and the overworld because the middle world water vapor is much, much higher. If I go back to this plot, you can see that the middle world uh, water vapor injection, where this is just the total amount over time, this is just, just the total integrated amount over the domain, is enormous. But as soon as you get above 380 Kelvin, this water vapor, though much, much, much smaller in total mass, is likely to stick around much longer in the stratosphere. So when you see a number like 13 kilotons, um, I, I guess I would also want to know information about how it's distributed before I can interpret it. And I just don't, I haven't found that yet. I had, I had a question as well. Um, so, well, thank you for um, a fantastic talk, <laughs> Morgan. Um, so you said uh, near the beginning that these AACPs are associated with extreme weather at the surface. And then most of your talks about how AACPs are associated with the high winds aloft and the hydraulic jump. So does that mean that somehow the hydraulic jump affects the evolution of the storm and leads to more extreme weather or? I think that is a fantastic hypothesis and uh, a likely one. And that's, that's next. We weren't able to run, we ran at such high resolution that we could run very few storms. I showed you two, we actually ran a number of others that didn't get published. Um, but we need to add, you know, for example, friction at the bottom boundary. That would be an important idealization that we need to throw out to, to actually evaluate lower wind speed. So that, that just remains to be seen, but it's a very tantalizing possibility and a really exciting one that somehow something at the satellite scale that we can see from space is indicating a, a new kind of evolution on the ground. So I'd love to solve that. Cool, thank you. Thanks. So I, I have a question about your your feedback uh, slide. Sure, so let me head over there. It's, it's probably a very naive question, but w why does the lower stratosphere cool? Uh, it cools because that's, sorry, because that's kind of the top of our blanket. So if we have this really thick blanket of water vapor and CO2 and you get to the top of it, then that's kind of the only region where we can cool. Um, additionally, we're losing the local heating due to absorption of shortwave, um, short, uh, absorption of shortwave by ozone if ozone is increasingly being destructed by the presence of water vapor and, you know, complicated chemistry. So there, are, so there are two reasons, the direct and the indirect reason for cooling. You know, just like, you know, the ocean is cooling. I don't know if this is a great analogy. It's what I thought of earlier. The ocean is cooling from the top, right? Yes. So it's also being heated from the top, but let's ignore that. But our atmosphere is also kind of cooling from the top. And so there's not a lot of water vapor above the lower stratosphere. I mean, there's like virtually none and there's not much, not much CO2 either. And so if that's the top of our insulating blanket that warms the surface, then that's the level that we cool from. Okay, so is there a... Yeah, perhaps I have uh, another question. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful and interesting talk. Perhaps I didn't get it right. You said uh, these AACPs are very interesting for the forecast of severe weather. But on the other hand, you said the AACP lifetime is only 30 minutes. Yeah. Um... Because That's, then uh, you have only 30 minutes time to, to foresee that there will be a severe weather, so. Uh, right, well, so the lifetime, I would say probably for forecasting, the lifetime matters a lot less than um, its first appearance. And uh, this paper here by Chris Bedka and colleagues showed that they, there's a high correlation between appearing and then on average 31 minutes later, very severe conditions being reported on the ground. So even though that doesn't sound like a lot, it's more than enough time to get in your basement. 
or more than enough time to pull off the highway and into a gas station. So that's plenty. If that's if that's the thing that gets to your phone, you know, in time, then that that's quite a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question about uh, where you're going with um, constructing some kind of parameterization for this. Um, yeah, it sounds like you've you've got a lot of ingredients there. And I was just wondering how um, how good the parameterization would have to be. Like, do you have to know exactly where this water is going to go into the stratosphere? Or is it good enough to say there's a storm in this region that's going to pump up some water and it doesn't matter exactly where it is? I think the latter will be all we need. Uh, certainly, uh, one should not be deciding where the water goes uh, laterally. It just needs to have access to the Brewer-Dobson circulation and, and up, you know, upper atmospheric wave breaking. So that I think that detail is less important. That'll pan out. But what we don't know is, yeah, just the amount and from what population of storms that we can kind of you know, resolve or parameterize. I mean, we're certainly not resolving individual storms and climate models. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and a parameterization. And that is how, you know, looking at a, a spectrum of, of grid resolutions, how coarse can we still identify something that would have had an AACP if it had been well resolved? Like what is, what is the version of a storm at, you know, five or 10 or 20, kilometers on a, on a storm day with high cape that we can back out would have had this feature if it if it had the resolution to. And so that's going to be a whole phase space of things because it should be a function of wind as well as cape, uh, as well as shear. I mean, we don't even have shear in this upper level profile, but shear is going to be extremely important for, for the water vapor um, injection. So yeah, we just need to run like a thousand simulations, hopefully really cheap, simple ones. <laughs> and then and then I, I'll have an answer for you after that. So when when should we invite you back to hear that answer? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's play it safe and say a decade. And then if it's any sooner than that, I'll send you an email. Excellent. I follow you on Twitter. So uh, ah, wonderful. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> So thanks, thanks again, Morgan. This was a really a great talk. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the invitation, especially on this really exceptional day of news for uh, climate dynamics. This is just uh, yeah. a great time to be talking about this sort of stuff. Right. I probably the, the next uh, Nobel Prize in uh, climate physics will be a woman, I guess. <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you for this opportunity. And I have, if people have questions after, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions by email. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll upload a video uh, to